Uh, my name is uh, Jim Mitchell from Industrial Heritage Consulting and uh, a member of the, the STIC group. Uh, I'm glad you could join us today for this uh, short talk on recognising materials. Uh, we're at the engine shed today in Stirling, uh, and if you haven't been, this is a great facility run by Historic Environment Scotland. Uh, we would like to stick. Would like to thank them for their collaboration in this event. Uh, I'd also would like to thank the MGS for funding this project from uh, its outset last year. This is our first attempt at a webinar, so please bear with us if there is a glitch or two along the way. Uh, Miriam MacDonald and Nelly Swinbank from Stick are operating the high-tech equipment in the background, so you've just got me to contend with, basically. Uh, we hope to do a short series of webinars on the theme of conservation of industrial objects and collections, and we appreciate just how much industrial mu museums rely on the staff covering lots of different bases, so uh, and also their core volunteer groups. So hopefully this will be of some help uh, to you. This is an enormous subject, really, uh, but we have to start somewhere. And if you're someone who is knowledgeable in engineering materi materials, my apologies if what I'm talking about states the obvious. So let's uh, kick off a Right, this is a, you probably most of you will recognise that this is a paddle steamer. It's actually the Maid of the Loch in Balloch, which has just got all its funding in place. And one of my jobs is to look after the, the complete restoration of the engine room back to running condition. Now, a, I was an engineer before I was a conservator, so I, I've Got, I had a slight advantage as far as recognising materials is concerned. But to, to, to the practice die, basically, you should be able to lean on the handrail here and cast your eye over the scene and uh, pick out what all the different materials are. Uh, big painted objects you would recognise as cast iron. And you can see down below there's a gold coloured material, and that's actually a bronze bearing. And the, beside that there's a crankshaft, which is a steel forging, uh, as well as all the piston rods, etc. Uh, you can tell by the colour of where the platforms are that they're aluminium, and the material in the background that's painted white is riveted steel. Now that's you know three or four different uh, types of material. Uh, identified in the, in the simplest way. Uh, we can get into lots of details about the different materials, for example, the, 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 the brass or the phosphor bronze and the bearings, but it's good enough that you can recognise what they are initially. What you should be able to do as, as, a, as someone that's involved with running a project is be able to cast your eye over a, a, a picture like this or a view like this and think, I think to yourself just what's involved in its conservation and all the problems you might come across. Uh, that might sound a big leap, but uh, you know, once your eyes practice, uh, it's it's not quite so difficult. Uh, okay, basically some large objects. Let's just take, for example, a, an old steam engine. Uh, if you look on the left hand side, there's a list of materials that you're likely to find. In older engines, you would find leather, but there would be all sorts of retention straps to hold back the valve gear and whatever. So they would be made out of leather. There would be wood, obviously iron, cast iron, wrought iron. Uh, there might have been some recent improvements where steel has been used, so you've got to be able to differentiate between uh, steel and wrought iron. Uh, bronze alloys and well, maybe not in an old steam engine, but there, there could be aluminium in some objects, and materials like rubber. Now, every one of these materials, the, the list of questions on the right will help quite a bit. Uh, you, you, you have obviously got to assess the condition of all these different materials. Uh, looking at the background history of the, of the piece of equipment, does help a lot because you can obviously identify from drawings and the uh, written histories 
of the object uh, that may help to identify materials or changes to the, the equipment in its lifetime. Uh, treatments is something you have to bear in mind uh, that relates to the material that you're looking at and how the different materials interact with each other in the object. Obviously, the duty that you expect that piece of equipment to do, if it was in a museum, it may be a, a static object. So that's the duty in a way. Uh, it could well be a, an operating a piece of operating equipment, so then there's a whole different set of uh, uh, requirements. Uh, is the, is, for example, if we're talking about cast iron and we want to get into the nitty gritty with it and we need to replace parts, we need to work out and try and find out what grade of iron it is so that you can do repairs or replacements with the correct grade of iron. Uh, same applies to steel and aluminium and other materials. Uh, is, is the material organic? Is it pure rubber or is it leather? Uh, these things are all important. And of course, the thing that underlies all of these questions is environment, and we'll come back to talk about that uh, later on. So, why why is it important to know these all these these things about your materials? Uh, we really need to know how it will behave in a, in, in a given environment. This is in this image is the High Mill in Dundee, where there was a Bolton and Watt steam engine from 1801 uh, conserved and put on display. Now I'll, I'll talk about this later in relation to another engine that's very similar and how the environment uh, affects how you must or should look after it. Uh, it's a bit like you really need to know how to conserve it. It's a bit like throwing a jumper in the wash without reading a label. You really need to understand uh, the material and the environment that you're going to put it in. So the, the practice die is, 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 is a thing that you need to develop. Uh, we, all, we can all look at things, but do we properly see them? This is a, an example here. A, I think the, the pans on the left may obviously be cast iron to, to, to someone, but you should be able to know that they're cast iron and not just a heavy piece of metal. Uh, the one on the right looks similar, but it, it looks new, which it is obviously, but it's actually not cast iron, it's cast aluminium. So maybe the only way you can tell is by lifting them and feeling the, the difference in the weight. That's the simple. Uh, the first simple step of assessing what the material is. So all is not what it necessarily appears to be. Uh, same with this. Uh, it's very popular now to put in retro type radiators. And if we, if we look at the one on the, the right hand side, this is a cast iron radiator, which is pretty much, the design is pretty much a Victorian design. Uh, because it's stylish and people are seeking these things, there's a modern spin on it, and the one on the left is put together in a, a very similar way. But the one on the left is made out of steel. So we've got two things that look similar, but one is steel and one is cast iron. And they may well behave in the same way uh, as far as the performance, but the way you would address uh, repairing them or looking after them depends very much on the material that you're looking at. Okay, uh, let's just look at uh, these metals. These are the three main contenders in, uh, as far as ferrous metals are concerned. Uh, certainly for historic equipment and historic machinery, cast iron is a big player. Uh, ornamental cast iron for gates and railings and whatever, it's, it's, it's good to recognise what is cast iron and not other types of ornamental iron. Uh, there are some disadvantages. Uh, it's quite, as you can see, uh, cast iron pan on the hob there is shattered. There's a good reason for that. Uh, it, it happens to be an induction hob, which heats up really, really quickly. And of course the cast iron, because it's been cast into a shape, it's got all sorts of inbuilt stresses. Uh, that can't cope with a sudden rise in temperature. Uh, if the temperature rises slowly, 
fair enough. It can expand kind of all over the object and everything's fine, but too much heat applied to one part of it, that's the result. So if you've got an induction hob, don't use cast iron uh, cooking pots on it. Now, th these are three examples of large cast iron objects. And quite often, these are new objects, obviously, but lots of historic uh, machinery holds uh, parts that look pretty much like this. Now, textures and finishes are a giveaway quite often. And if we look at the, the, the picture on the top left is an iron casting. Now, it's been machined, uh, cast iron machines in a certain way, and the, 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 the product as you machine it is a very fine dust, or if you machine it really heavily, you get chips come off it. But the dis distinctive thing about it is the colour. It is a grey colour, and even with a high, a, a high level finish, it will still remain grey. Now, the casting in the top right is aluminium. Now, you can see again, you can see the aluminium colour on the inside and uh, the finishes on the machine parts, which is basically the, where, where the two halves of the piece of equipment bolt together. Uh, you'll see that it can be a higher polish than the cast iron. The one on the bottom isn't a casting. It's a steel billet that's been machined. So it started off as a, a lump of steel that came out rolling the rolling mill and it's machined uh, on all sides. Now you can see obviously from the, the pattern of the machining that there's a much higher shine to the, the finish. And also after a while you'll recognise what kind of machines were used to, to get the finish. Uh, there's been, because of that gramophone effect in the front, you know that it's been a machine with a big, large diameter cutter that's run across the face of it. And this is, sometimes this is quite a good little indicator. Uh, the top left is cast iron that's been, a, that's the product of the machining and it's been a really heavy machine cut. The, the cast iron has come off in chips. Now, cast iron is a very brittle material. So for it to come off in little curly uh, cuttings like that, you know there's a lot of heat being involved. More commonly, the, the, the cast iron dust uh, on the lower left is the product you would get if you were turning on a lathe or whatever. And uh, it's the kind of thing that you would use for science experiments with a magnet and have a bit of fun with. Uh, on the right hand side, these are steel cuttings and you can see the long curly uh, the long, long curly strands of, of steel, but also you can see they're quite blue, so that means that they were cut at a very high speed uh, and uh, obviously lots of heat generated. Uh, cast iron in its, uh, in its best its best form and probably the one that we, we all like to look at, but at first glance it may not appear to be cast iron until your eyes practiced uh, this, the, the, the fountain on the right is uh, in Paisley and uh, because it's got such an elaborate colour scheme which emulated the original colour scheme, it stops looking like iron, it looks like something completely different. Uh, the monument on the left, which is in the Necropolis in Glasgow, uh, is by the same company, the Sun Foundry, a uh, Glasgow company. Now what's happened in the one on the left is that all the bolts that held all the parts together uh, were wrought iron, so they interact with the cast iron and the, the, the wrought iron bolt sacrifices and fails. So basically the thing goes into a state of collapse. Uh, and both both of these objects were in the same condition before restoration. All the, all the, the fastenings had failed on the fountain as well and it was about to fall down basically. So, uh, interactive corrosion is something that we'll talk about a bit later as well. Okay, raw time. Now, this is the one, the most misunderstood of them all, probably. Uh, it's important to say that raw time is a material, not a product. Now, basically, it's the same uh, metallurgically, it's the same as cast iron, uh, but it's worked, hence the word rot. It's worked until it becomes a bar, 
or a particular shape, usually a, a long round bar or a flat bar or whatever. So you work all the, the without getting too technical about it, you, the, the, the internal ingredients are all worked to lie in the same direction. Now, if you look at the lower image, it's always this is quite a drastic way to find out uh, if it's raw iron or not by cutting it or breaking it. Uh, th these these two were cut halfway through and then then a break put into them. But if you look at the one in the bottom there, you'll see the the end view. Uh, now on the right hand side of that end view, you'll see lots of little dots on the surface. Now that's actually the the ends of the slag strands. And if you think of a bar of Blackpool, stick of Blackpool rock, it's kind of the same idea. The, the, the letters run all the way through the iron, or through the, the rock, but they also, the, the strands of carbon run all the way through the iron bar because they've been worked to lie that way. And that's what gives it a, gives it the strength to a large degree. It's a bit like another way to think of it, another analogy of it would be fiberglass where you've got glass strands running through the resin. Now the resin itself is quite brittle, but the glass strands give it the strength. So there we can see in that cut example, we can see the, fib the fibrous nature of it. Okay, these, these are, are basically a mix of different things. The, the anchor up in the top left is wrought iron. Now that has been formed from Different, different shapes of basic material and then worked into a shape. Now you can see as it starts to corrode, it has a kind of wood-like appearance. You have, a, a, you have striations in the, in the iron. It makes it look for all the world like a piece of wood that's weathered a bit. Now, and if you look at the bottom, this is the way wrought iron corrodes. It corrodes very slowly because it builds up a it builds up a, a patination uh, and the, the, actually the corrosion slows down as long as it's in the, not in a hostile environment. Now if we look at the, the bottom right image, you can see the same effect on the chain links. But if you look at the one above, the chain above, uh, that's not raw iron, that's a steel chain. Now you can see that the corrosion on that is more about pitting. So you can see the corrosion acts on the two chains in a completely different way. So you can immediately identify one as rot and one as steel. Uh, another, another effect with wrought iron when the environment isn't so good is some ornamental cast iron railings, bottom left there. When they put these panels together, uh, they tie them along the top with a strip of wrought iron, then they put a cast iron capping rail. Now that's to stabilise the whole structure, but what happens is the it's a, not a very nice environment underneath that that uh, uh, cast iron capping rail, and you get uh, basically lamination in the raw iron, and of course that expands as it corrodes. I mean it can grow to many times its original thickness, so the heave created with that expansion then fractures the iron, and you can see that it's thrown off a piece of iron at the side. Uh, now you can see the reason why the water get in because it just so happens that's that's at a join in the capping rail. You can see the join across the top. Now the water has got in through that join, uh, penetrated into the wrought iron and caused that expansion. So these are some good examples of the the, the effects of corrosion on wrought iron. Now of course the biggest wrought iron structure that nobody knows is wrought iron. Well, a few of you do. Uh, is the Eiffel Tower. So tremendous medium and obviously the, the care that goes into an object like this has to be pretty serious uh, because of the environment, the city environment the environment that it's in. And uh, I'm sure nowadays there'll be all sorts of cathodic protection bolted to it, whatever, to make sure that it survives. Okay, this is a bee I have in my bonnet. And this is a wrought iron, a, a wrought iron gates by a, Thomas Haddon. And these are actually a, at Holyrood Palace. There's a, there's a few of these gates. Now, these were made by a master craftsman, a, a blacksmith, and they're 
quite quite famous uh, is, is wrought iron gates, and they are wrought iron gates. But wrought iron, insofar as that's the material used to make the gates. Now, if you look at the gates on the right, I hope none of you've got any of them at home. They're pretty horrendous looking, but uh, these are steel gates, and they're, they're, people call them they call it wrought iron work, which is a complete misnomer. It is not. It, it is basically a steel gate. Uh, been fabricated and welded together by a blacksmith who calls himself a blacksmith, but it's basically a, a, a steel fabricator. Uh, there's lots of things about that that's wrong, but we won't get into that. But I think it's important to know that wrought iron is a material, and the wrought meaning the working of the iron, not working it into a shape. It's the production of the iron that makes it wrought. Okay. Uh, there was a period when the transition from timber ships to uh, steel ships it was quite a short period uh, where uh, the material, the big big leap forward was to use uh, iron. So when we talk about iron ships, we really mean, strictly speaking, we mean wrought iron ships. Now this is the SS Great Britain down in Bristol. And uh, the hull is in a protected environment. You can see the glass roof above. Now they've got all sorts of air uh, controlling equipment down there, dehumidifying, but it doesn't really work because the dry dock leaks quite badly. So the corrosion carries on, sadly. Uh, but if you look on the left, you can see that the, the plates are much, much smaller than on a later riveted steel ship because that was basically the size of plate that could be handled by uh, the, 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 the blacksmiths and uh, the, the iron workers. So each one of these plates would be shaped uh, by a couple of guys, two or three guys, holding the plate under a, a steam hammer and trying to get shape into it. And they would damage as many plates as they, as they ever did to get right. So it was quite, quite a, a leap forward in technology. Okay, uh, steels in all our lives. You know, I'm probably sitting in a building that's got lots of steel frame uh, work on it. There's uh, we have steel bridges, we have steel in everything. Our cars, you name it, steel is that ubiquitous material. But probably fundamental to all our lives, really. Uh, this is an image taken in one of the last of the big engineering works in Scotland. This is a uh, Cochrane's down in Annan. Uh, and that's a steam boiler being fabricated on the, on the left hand side there, and part of a boiler being machined. Now, the technology technology does move on, uh, although this particular factory does operate in a very traditional way. Uh, the, the steel itself has to be rolled, it's a, it's a very malleable material. Uh, it has to be rolled into the shape and then welded together. So it's a very, very a manageable material that can be moved into all sorts of different shapes. If you can see the part that's been machined on the right hand side, you'll see we talked about the cuttings earlier on. You can see cuttings lying around where, where the machining has just finished. You've got that kind of curly effect, which again proves how malleable the, the steel is. Okay, here's a statement. It is, I would say, it is pretty important. Now, this is steel from the side of the ship, uh, actually from the Titanic. Now, there's a theory on doing the rounds just now, and well, there's always theories about the Titanic, isn't there? But uh, in particular, what they've done is they've tested samples of the steel, and no one would dream of building a ship out of the material that was used then. What they've found is that down to a couple of degrees above zero and a couple of degrees below zero, this steel became very brittle, as did the wrought iron rivets. Now there was wrought iron and steel rivets in the ship, there was a mix. Uh, but basically the, the hull shattered rather than was torn as it would have been with modern steel. Uh, but the hull shattered because of the temperature of the water. Uh, that's the theory.
and I think it's been pretty much proved now that uh, it didn't help much. Okay, so corrosion is a big, a big factor with the ferrous metals. It is a, they're basically always trying to turn themselves back to from back to whence they came, to, back to the iron ore. So you can inhibit that by adding to the mix when the, the steel is being made. And of course, of course, very importantly, the, the environment that the steel, uh, steel is in. Now, the coatings that are chosen uh, must suit the environment uh, and also uh, the preparation of the metal before the coating is, is crucial as well. Uh, sacrificial corrosion is a, is a big thing that quite often, you know, having worked on lots of 19th century equipment, there wasn't a, a great understanding of the principle of sacrificial corrosion. Uh, and that's one of the major issues nowadays. And of course, low levels of maintenance to uh, ferrous objects uh, uh, contributes. So environment, a uh, big thing. Uh, you, you can have a, a museum that the environment's controlled basically for the public. So it's warmer than it actually needs to be quite often. Uh, for the object's sake, uh, in fact, the, the, the warmth in a museum can be detrimental to some materials. Uh, a museum store or a storage shed it, it can be undercover, but basically have an outside environment. Or the object can be just simply stored outside. So when you've got relative humidity, obviously, is a big factor. So low temperature, uh, and high moisture levels will work much more aggressively uh, on a, a ferrous object. And of course, if you're, at, if you're beside the sea, you've got the, 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 the salt in the air, which creates a, an electrolytic effect and uh, promotes the corrosion. Uh, environment is important. This is something I, I was actually working on on Monday. Uh, it's a part of the made of the lock, the paddle steamer, it's the steering head. It's a hydraulic steering head. Now that, that piece of kit is 82 years old. Now we've got an aluminium case, which isn't the best in a, in a marine environment, because this the ship that it came off a, before it went to the made of the lock was actually seagoing. Now aluminium doesn't like a seagoing environments because uh, there is, there is the, uh, quite a, a, a high level of uh, corrosion. But more than that, what you've got here is a high quality steel within that top chamber. But the thing is, it was a, a protected environment. It was uh, probably low oxygen. And the indications were when I opened it up that it hadn't been opened probably for a long, long time. There was no, no marks of uh, people um, trying to get into it. So the condition is immaculate. So the interior parts, although they are subject to corrosion, they are just a uh, carbon steel, uh, are in really good condition because they were in a low oxygen, uh, fully oiled environment with no penetration whatsoever. Now, what, the only thing that you would get in that situation is if there was any moisture in the air when it was assembled, that moisture will never go away. It's trapped there forever. So you've got a miniature ecosystem. And you can just see in the bottom right, the right hand image, you'll see a little bits of corrosion where there's been water droplets. But all in all, uh, in extremely good condition. Uh, take it to the other extreme. extreme. This is a project we're working on up in Hoy in Orkney. And it's a, the last of the big steel World War II oil tanks that were built by Sir William Arles. Now, as you can just see the, the image in the top left, there's a door cut into the side of the tank. Now, what they've done is they've created a museum inside. Uh, it's, it's actually just at the moment all the, the stuff's been moved out, but it's the worst possible museum environment you could think of, really. Uh, I'm afraid the, the budget doesn't stretch to environmental control, so the problem will only go away to a certain extent. 
the roof is about to be completely replaced because it's completely perforated. Uh, the roof was designed to blow off in an explosion, so it was a very thin steel. But no environmental control, a very, very low temperatures most of the year, and then a sudden hike in temperature on a sunny day. Uh, so there's a, a complete uh, ecosystem. The, the water that leaked in through the, the, the roof lies in the floor. Uh, the, the building heats up, it evaporates, goes up and condenses in the roof and falls as rain. So the, the vehicles that are in there have to be treated in a, a very particular way, uh, uh, much more carefully than it would be in a controlled environment in a museum. And th this is an interesting comparison. He uh, did this engine on the left hand side, the Bolton Watt engine, oh, 20, 20 odd years ago in the National Museum in Chamber Street in Edinburgh. The problem we had here was a, 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 an environment that was very carefully and strictly controlled. So all the timber elements in this conservation uh, restoration, really, uh, were all brand new elements of Douglas fir. We had terrible problems for about three years until the timber stabilised in that very, very dry controlled environment. Uh, and there was constant adjustments. Obviously, the metal parts don't change, it's just the timber. So there's lots of movement, shrinkage, changes in clearances in the metal, constantly had to adjust it so that it would turn. But when we flip over to the, the high mill at the Verdant Works in Dundee, this was done a couple of years ago. Now the building was almost roofless and the stonework and floor were completely saturated. Now that building is drying out and it will continue to dry out for quite a few years to come. However, the historic timber in the engine, the dark coloured timber, was in a, an environmentally controlled museum store for decades. So it was very, very dry. The store was basically controlled to suit everything that was in it, but nothing in particular. So the timber eh, was extremely dry. So that, that historic timber will be taking on moisture from the building as it dries out, whereas the timber that you see, the, the coloured timber, is brand new. Eh, it's Douglas fir. So it's giving up moisture. So we've got one lot of timber drying out and the other eh, the other taking on water. And I reckon that'll need close monitoring for about 10 years uh, to make sure that all the clearances and all the, the parts that move can all move freely as the, the shape of the wood and the sizes change. Okay, a, something you come across if you're working on equipment where there's the bearings involved. Copper is the most amazing material, I think. It's one of my favourite materials in lots of different ways. It forms the basis of some really exotic materials, and basically it was its own, probably it's the first industrial revolution, you could argue, when the alloys were made from the copper, and obviously the copper ore was turned into to metal. It's got the advantage of being very soft and malleable and I suppose in early days when you didn't have the tools because you didn't have the metals to make the tools, the tools we were using were probably wooden tools. Uh, so to add some, add different metals to, to the copper uh, creates all sorts of exotic uh, materials which we'll talk about. Uh, below you can see all the different materials that you can add to it and create quite uh, materials that perform in lots of different ways. And of course, you can use it in all sorts of things, from uh, coins right through to modern building materials. And the way that it patinates uh, is very attractive. You get that lovely green blue, uh, which everyone will have seen on buildings and roofs and whatever. But the only limit is your imagination as far as the uses of copper is concerned. Okay, sorry about the small print, but uh, 
these are the, 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 the list on the left hand side are the materials you'll come across in conservation. The first three are the ones that are banded about quite a bit. Uh, brass is a kind of generic term that we all use, and it's not always actually brass. Uh, then you've got Admiralty brass, which is basically just a, a higher spec where the ingredients are much more controlled and the balance changes slightly of the, the different ingredients. But it was an Admiralty standard that the, the brass was made to, that's why it was called Admiralty, Admiralty to brass. It tends to, it tends to have a darker colour. Uh, once it uh, loses its newness, uh, it, can, it can look anything from brown right through to a, a, a dull blue-green. Gunmetal is exactly what it says. It was the material they used to make guns out of. Uh, and again, controlled very much by a government edict uh, for making cannons, etc. Uh, that was superseded uh, in the 19th century, probably the late 18th century, uh, with cast iron, obviously. So the percentages in the mix is the, the thing that varies rather than the content. Uh, Gunmetal tends to be a, a, a reddish colour. In fact, uh, I think in the, in the United States they talk about red brass, uh, and it, it, it again tarnishes to a dull green. Now bronze is pretty much a wonder material in as much as it's changed little through the ages. Except nowadays we add boring, you know, it started off basically a mixture of copper and tin, but for different duties you add different metals in, uh, to, to the admix. Uh, if it's a marine environment, you'll probably have lots of phosphor in it. Uh, a fantastic material for bearings is aluminium bronze. Uh, it, make, it allows it to be machined nicely and uh, it survives really well in a marine environment. And then another one, which is a really nice word, is sintered bronze. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And it's basically lead that's added to the mix uh, that gives it all sorts of extra qualities. And here's an example. Up in the top left is sintered bronze. And you can see that if you look at it closely, you can see all the little particles in it. It's quite a nice material. Uh, and that's basically the lead that's uh, mixed into the, to the mix. The bearing that's been opened up in the bottom left is a bearing that's been running. Now you can see there's lots of grooves in the, the steel part of the steel shaft where uh, different materials have got in, probably grit and bits and pieces of metal have got into the bearing. Maybe some dirty oil was added that had some grit in it. Uh, and that's what happens to the steel. Now what happens is the bearing itself, the same thing happens to the bearing, but there is a clearance between the shaft and the bearing. And there's an oil film runs in that clearance. Now that oil film should run all the way around uh, and it won't just be sitting hard on the bottom. You'll have the shaft will float in the theory, it'll float in that uh, bearing space. But particles of grit do, do the damage. Uh, on the top picture is one that's been redone or repaired. Uh, interesting in that it's got, you can see that it's got quite, it's got quite a high polish on it. So all the, the grooves uh, uh, have been taken out. Having said that, if you look at the bottom left again, you can see that the wear it gives a gramophone effect. So you've got. You've got these grooves, so each groove has got a side to it and a top to it. So if you take that, multiply it right across the bearing surface, you're increasing the surface area of that bearing quite a bit. So it's not necessarily a disaster, eh, as long as it's under control and you make sure that it doesn't get any worse. Check it every so often, make sure everything's properly aligned and it's properly lubricated. So it's not a disaster and, and necessarily. And if you look at the right hand image, that's pretty much a similar type of bearing. Uh, these are very expensive uh, to have made, uh, especially to size, because you can see, because of, at, the, at the end of the bearing, you've got what you call a thrust face. So if there's any move, movement, lateral movement of the shaft, 
these faces absorb that lateral movement. In fact, you can see it on the top image, centre image. You can see the thrust plate on the steel gear. Uh, that runs against the thrust face on the bearing itself. So to, to give you that large flange, you've always got to start with a piece of bronze that's the full diameter uh, before you start machining it. Uh, these probably would be machined from solid. Uh, they're too fine a shape to have been cast uh, in, that, in that, uh, that style. Okay. Probably most of you won't have come across this metal. It's known in the, the engineering trade as white metal. But the, the old name for it is Babbitt. And we don't talk about Babbitt metal, we just talk about Babbitt. Uh, and it can be lots and lots of different ingredients in it, but the, the, the main two ingredients are lead and tin. Now it's a very soft material. You can mark it quite easily. Uh, I won't say you mark it with your fingernail, but you can scratch it quite easily. Now, if a steel shaft is running on that bearing and it runs out of oil, that bearing will be gone in seconds. It melts and wipes out, as they say. So it must be completely submerged in oil at all times. Uh, but it's a very, very free running bearing and it saves the expense of replacing a massive bronze bearing. You can see the top left hand side there's a bronze bearing with a, a white metal layer on it. So when the white metal wipes out, uh, you would notice somewhere that your oil pressure would drop. So you stop the machine and the bearing would need to be remetal. Uh, if you drive around in your car, your crankshaft has white metal bearings. And they have done right from the days of Henry Ford right through to the present. So you've got a, a white metal bearing that goes into a shell. Uh, that, that's called a shell, it goes into a, a bearing housing. And uh, basically the main ingredient in that mix is tin. So if you've got a car engine turning at 5,000 revolutions per minute, that's what's carrying the, the, the thrust of the, the piston rods and the crankshaft. So it's a tremendous material. The scraping a bearing, you'll see these tools on the right hand side. That is the tools you use to scrape a bearing. And this is a skill that has been rapidly lost. You can see the one that's been held in the centre has got a blue tinge on the right hand side. Now that bearing has been tried on a shaft that you put a blue die onto, you wipe onto it. And then you move the bearing across the die and then the high spots in the bearing show up as blue. So you then take these tools and you bring down the heavily blued areas so that the bearing's touching all the way around. The grey area in the centre is where the damage has been. There's been too much clearance there and the oil's overheated and caused burning in the bearing. So what you have to do there is take all the good metal out until you can back down onto the burnt area uh, to create a new bearing surface. Uh, and uh, the ones up in the top left, you can see the blue on them, they've been worked on in the same way. So aluminium, let's say if you work in an aircraft museum or anywhere where there's modern, uh, modern exhibits, aluminium crops up quite, quite a bit. Now, it is one of these materials that people think last forever, but they certainly don't. Uh, I was just told recently it's the most plentiful ore on earth. Uh, the big problem is the amount of energy that's needed to, to, smelt, the, to smelt the ore. Uh, and it comes in all sorts of different grades from aircraft grade right down. Uh, it's very easy to work. The problem is, a, like steel, it can develop stress fractures if it's worked too much when it's cold and temperature affects that as well. Uh, I would say aluminium generally would fail before steel, uh, but there are mixes of aluminium that are much longer lasting. One that springs to mind is dual aluminium, uh, which is used quite a lot in aircraft. Uh, the famous story about the, co the, the, the Comet, the, one of the first jet airliners, uh, basically started falling out of the sky when the, 
they developed stress fractures around the windows because they made the windows square instead of round. And that developed the stress so that when the fuselage was flexing, the stress fracture started in the corners of the windows. Uh, so yes, poor design basically. Big advantage is it's much lighter than <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Talking too much. <coughs> uh, it's much lighter than steel. <coughs> and it forms an, <coughs> an oxide layer and then stabilizes. <coughs> Now, aluminium is a, <coughs> a very conductive material, <coughs> so uh, it's highly active materials, a bit like copper, and it's prone to very fast galvanic corrosion. So that's one of the uh, one of the things that you have to be very careful with. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, aluminium can create art. This isn't the real thing, this is actually a, a model that's made from aluminium and all the parts that are in it that you can see uh, in the model are actually aluminium. <coughs> uh, and it's a thing of beauty. Okay, organic materials. Yeah, th these can be a problem. We, When we restored the, the Bolton Watt engine up at a, Dundee, Lots of the retention springs or shock absorbers on the, the valve levers in the engine were made out of leather. <clears throat> and we found out very quickly that uh, we couldn't use the original items because they'd gone hard and we, they, were, they would have been put at risk. So we basically substituted, <clears throat> we substituted modern, uh, modern leather. Uh, so you have to be very careful with the uh, 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 leathers and how you treat them. The treatment of materials is a whole different subject and uh, we could do a, a, another another presentation on that. Uh, fabrics again quite often. Uh, <clears throat> some, of the, some of the classic objects that spring to mind are things like blacksmith's bellows where you've got a whole mix of material you've got timbers, you've got, you may have rubber seals, you may have leather. Uh, so big issue obviously is the environment that the, the object is in. And of course, it's a, over the years we've restored a few blacksmiths uh, shops, smitties, and uh, not the best environment in the world, but the fact that the, the equipment was being used, it was being treated uh, quite often using it, using it sensibly and uh, with a bit of knowledge protects the object uh, in itself. And of course the leather has been treated all the time with the uh, waxes and oils as the blacksmith would have done. <coughs> Rubber is a difficult one, a pure uh, a organic rubber, a natural rubber is very, very prone to breaking down under ultraviolet light and uh, obviously the level of humidity in the building uh, affects it quite a bit. Fabrics, not my area, but fabrics are obviously uh, susceptible to their environment. And if, it, if it's an aircraft, you can have all of these. You could have leather. First World War aircraft could, could have some aluminium in it. It can have leather, it can have fabrics. The wings can be covered in fabrics, they could be rubber. And then you can have a iron and steel fixed to the to, to aluminium, say. <clears throat> so yeah, all sorts of problems with organic material, but it's it's, it's good to recognise them and uh, then take steps to deal with them. So timber is a difficult one. A, the, the, the basic things, that you, the basic thing you need to do is identify it. Mm. Uh, is it a native hardwood or is it a tropical hardwood? First thing, obviously, if you're bringing it into your collection, you really need to look at the, the condition. Is it in? Has it been somewhere really dry or somewhere really moist? 
Is it, has it got infestation, which is the big one you need to watch. Uh, there is a material that crops up historically from the, the late 1700s right through to the Second World War. And it's known, kind of, the generic term is pitch pine, and it's used in just about everything uh, from buildings, from old mills, from the, from the joists and the flooring, uh, to the sides of railway wagons, you name it, a uh, pitch pine was used. Now, just be careful when someone tells you that something is pitch pine, uh, find out how old it is. If it's any older than uh, probably halfway through the 30s, it probably isn't pitch pine because they'd cut it all down by that time. Uh, so things get called pitch pine nowadays and they are so it's a, it's a kind of term that's used, abused a bit. So the, the modern substitute is what we would call red pine. So you've got things like Scots pine and Douglas fir are a, a substitute for pitch pine, but they're, they're not, not anywhere near as, as good. And the environment again is, a, is an issue with them. Uh, there are hundreds of tropical hardwoods, but there's probably half a dozen that are used quite regularly. So if you come to things like the decks of ships and the tops of handrails, materials like crop up like teak, which is now, if we think of, let's do a comparison. If you think of a, a Douglas fir, you'll pay around 500 pounds a cubic meter for Douglas fir. For Burma, Burmese, you're probably up about seven or eight thousand pounds a cubic meter. So other substitutes are used. <clears throat> White pine is basically your indoor building material that you would use nowadays, and unless it's for knocking up a display, it's not something you would ever use in conservation. Red pine is more reliable, but again, you have to think about the environment you're going to put it in eh, and think about what's going to happen to it. Is it kiln dried? Is it has it been air dried? Is it is it green? Is it in other words, is it just freshly cut? You need to know how it's going to behave when you take it into your controlled or not controlled environment. Uh, oak is the one that crops up a lot, obviously, and the uh, seasoning is the most important thing. Uh, how has it been seasoned? Uh, and obviously, when it's freshly cut, it leaches tannin for quite a few years. And they've actually seen the tannin in oak uh, go right through a piece of lead uh, that was uh, put underneath it to, to protect the oak from moisture in a building. Where it had been pocketed into the wall, there was a, a lead plate put down, and basically the tannin ate through the lead. So all these things you've got to think about. Infestation, as I said, uh, you must take it out of your, if you've got indication that if there is infestation, is to take it out of the, an environment where it would threaten anything else. And last one is environment. It crops up again and again uh, as an issue. This is, <clears throat> this is an interesting one. This is the, the last steam slipway in uh, Britain. It's at Valach again for the, the paddle steamer made of the log. Now this was restored in 2006 and then we, the only material we could use was Douglas fir. The, the original pitch pine had basically just, it had its day, it had been built in 1902 and it had been in a, an outside environment. Because it's kind of in a highland environment, you had really low frosts, low temperatures, so you had hard frost. So once the ice and the, the, the ice and the frost gets into the wood and then expands the wood, uh, expands the fibres, then moisture penetration uh, can kick off quite quickly. And you can see there on the right where there was cool blocks fitted and it's all gone black and rotted underneath. So all that will need to be cut out and new material put in. So, <clears throat> with that particular piece of equipment, it's got to take out a 500 ton ship, so it's got to be good. And it's also an A-listed, part of the A-listed building, so it has to be repaired 
uh, as, as carefully and as uh, sympathetically as, as we possibly can. So, yes, don't create hostile environments, I'm saying there, but sometimes you have no choice. Uh, and don't you make sure that you plan the timber you're going to use. Don't just phone up the timber merchants the week before you start. And you should have organised your timber probably six months in advance. If it's big pieces like that, because you want it air dried, if it's going to be outside. <clears throat> and as I say, these these big bulks of timber, they're over, you know, they're over a, a, a foot or. 300 mil square, so uh, pressure treating them really doesn't make much difference. So, uh, as I said before, the, the pitch pine, so called, is actually was grown right down the east coast of the States, uh, but it's all been long since it was all first growth and it's all since been logged out. So, beware if someone is telling you it's pitch pine, unless it's recycled. So that's about it. I would just like to finish off saying that you know all may not be as it seems. Uh, if you look at this, is the the Ross Fountain in Edinburgh that's being currently rebuilt, uh, and what you can do and how you can finish cast iron. The the idea here is to create an effect of patinated bronze. The color the color condition hasn't come up that well, but it's like in a greeny blue colour. And if you look at the, the third image in from the left, you can see what the guys have done in the corner of that piece, where they've made it look as if it's been worn away. So at first glance, it looks like a, a bronze casting, but it's good old fashioned cast iron. So uh, you can do all sorts of things with coatings. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and when I say I don't don't ask, I don't mean don't ask any questions. I'm just saying don't ask what the picture is. That's a, an up and coming project that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Okay, thank you very much for listening and watching. Uh, or remember, uh, tech, oh yes, that was the. Uh, I've just been reminded that the uh, if you've experienced any technical difficulties, not 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 related to me, uh, but with the sound or the, the, the vision or the images, uh, please uh, email Ellie uh, because she would really appreciate feedback for the uh, for future presentations. So thank you very much. Bye.